The most uh, relevant work this year was my participation in the so-called PEST committee. Uh, and the PEST, that's not about the illness PEST, but it's about uh, pesticides and the allowance procedure or permission procedure for pesticides. There were several really interesting insights. First of all, under which circumstances new pesticides get a permission from the European Union side. We've seen that uh, uh, basically industry is paying the studies, industry is choosing the studies, industry is summarizing the studies uh, and there were a lot of question marks whether first of all the scientific assessment is fit for purpose second question was uh, are the environmental standards met and what environmental standards are actually included in that procedure and we managed earlier already uh, the green group to include pollinators uh, as as indications whether pesticides are harmful to environment or not which was a major step forward that actually led to the prohibition of neonicotinoids uh, at least three of the most dangerous and most used ones, um, and uh, and and there, I mean, some of the some of the results serve uh, the fight for rescuing the pollinators, which are that in the future also the cocktails of different pesticides that are applied together or in a row with each other uh, should be also tested. There's no testing in the moment, so only the active substance of every single pesticide is tested, but never uh, the combination of the different pesticides applied at the same time. Uh, and as we know, there's synergetic, uh, um, uh, uh, well, co-functionings of pesticides, which, which can endanger um, also pollinators, but also other insects, even though the active substance of a single pesticide doesn't. Uh, I could go much deeper into that, but I think the result is a quite strong one. Uh, the the uh, permission procedures will be renewed, uh, and there will be a stronger focus on the impact on environment overall and also of the residues you know what stays what stays left in the soil and what is probably picked up by the next generation of plants so even if the first plant is not flowering the question is how much stays in the soil and how much does the next uh, uh, next crop that is planted on that field actually uptake into their uh, into their flowers also the chronicle uh, um, influence on pollinators and bees and other insects has to be uh, stronger, uh, examined and researched in the future. So I think there were some major improvements. Well, you just need to do the research on it. Yeah? Uh, if you include, uh, if you include into the permission process that the industry is obliged to serve uh, the permission agencies, the EFSA, or whoever it is, uh, with that research, uh, you will already see some effects because then it becomes obvious what is harmful and what not, or what is less harmful, what is more harmful. So we just have to include it into the permission process. I think that will help a lot already. But to go a step further, me personally, I'm an organic. Farmer, I'm an organic beekeeper. Uh, so if you ask me what kind of agriculture system we need, uh, then it is one that actually works with hardly any pesticides, or even if you need some substances to take minor toxic ones, uh, to work with crop rotation, to work with the high biodiversity. Uh, and yes, sometimes the yield can be a bit lower, but what, what do I gain if I have a bit more yield, but on the other hand, I destroy environment, I destroy the health of my citizens, uh, and and I destroy, um, I, I have a negative climate effect. Uh, so I think we should see the bigger picture and change the agriculture strategy at all. I, I, one thing has to be clear, there was only a vote in the Agri Committee. That means there is a work prepared, but the next parliament can take it up or cannot take it up. The next Agricultural Committee can actually start the work from scratch if they want. So uh, the plenary has not voted it yet. And I think it's a good opportunity also to actually ask yourself what kind of agricultural system do you want in the future? This could be a motivation to vote for some parties and maybe not for others. Uh, so I, I think this is, this is, a, this is a key message message actually. What we have on the table now, I personally was shadow rapporteur, means uh, on the table on finding compromises on the common market organization and there there were some improvements. We actually voted in favor of the common market um, uh, regulations. There's some improvement uh, also covering honey and bee products, including them as potential aims also for interventions if the prices go down into the cellar. Uh, there's also some advantages we, uh, on 
um, in terms of labeling, that labeling has to be unified across the European Union so that consumers can compare different products with each other and can actually make up their mind what product they want to buy. The overall agricultural policy we see very critical, the outcomes. We actually voted against the, the, the results at the end because, uh, well, one step that could be seen positively was to measure the impact of agriculture policy based on results, on, on, yeah, on certain goals which the union gives and then the nations have to kind of uh, uh, prove that they, that they meet the results. And there we, we managed to include uh, pollinators as an indicator whether you reached your goal in terms of biodiversity uh, and, and securing biodiversity. It's not only our bees, our honeybees, but it's also the natural pollinators which are at stake and which are heavily under pressure. Uh, that's positive. What is negative is, as an example, the ecological preference areas are not mentioned at all anymore. This word, the stripes of flowers and stripes of, of, of uh, also, um, uh, well, room for insects to, to, uh, to grow their, their, their next generations. Yeah? This is not included at all. At the first round, the conservatives wanted to allow pesticides decides in ecological preference areas, which is, I think, a contradiction within the sentence. Yeah? How can you use pesticides in ecological preference areas? Now they are not in at all. What is positive again is that crop rotation is mentioned as a basic condition to get uh, subsidies at all, which will serve us beekeepers a lot because if there's more diversity in the landscape, uh, that means there's more hope that our bees find some honey. Um, but, but overall, they, they plan a renationalization, which means the states, well, they have to prove they reach the goals, but if not, what then? Uh, are we then cutting the money? Are we asking the money back? So I think this is going to end up in kind of weak procedures of, well, demanding and asking the states to improve and so on. But uh, it from our point of view, it would have been better to have clear rules, strict rules, where everybody knows what is at stake, and then you can clearly quote whether a, whether a state, a member state, is following the rules yes or no. Yeah? And there's no debates whether the goals are reached a bit more or a bit less. Yeah? So we're critical of that. Uh, well, I mean, I really hope that the next parliament and the next agricultural committee, which I will be possibly part of, uh, will actually renegotiate that cap. Because from my point of view, uh, and, and, and there I'm also on the same side with parts of the Commission, uh, is that we want public money to go for public goods. And public goods is high biodiversity, is clean water, drinking water, is uh, a clean air, so no pollution. Uh, and this we can only reach if we change our agricultural model based on agroecological agro systems. Uh, in my favor it would be even organic, but I don't want to go that far because that's not going to happen that fast as I would wish. But even in conventional agriculture, there's differences between intelligent and future-oriented techniques and backwarded and back back-minded uh, uh, strategies. We, we, so, so, but for that, I think we should start to think whether we should still go for world market presence uh, of European products, which forces us to produce under the same weak and industrial standards as the rest of the world, or if we shouldn't change our strategy towards uh, a goal to take European taxpayers' money, to serve European agriculture with it, to produce basically for European consumers uh, and not for the world market. And that doesn't mean that we can't still trade what we need more or trade where we have an overproduction, but I think our strategy should be based on European consumers and serving environment and healthy food to our customers. Customers. Yes, exactly. We I, also here we need clear rules, clear measurements, clear levels uh, to to be able to quote whether a member state is really putting the right policies in place or not. Uh, that has to be clear. I think what we also have to work on is the question on importing honey and also importing artificial honey or mixtures of real and artificial honey. First of all, I think all uh, food products that enter European Union should actually apply to the same, very same standards that we have in the 
European agriculture, that would already exclude a lot of importations. Second of all, I think we have to label clearly where a product is coming from. We see that when consumers actually clearly see what is a national or European Union product and what is actually imported from where, uh, people start to get uh, curious or, or even reluctant to buy imp imported, uh, uh, in this case, honey and, and have a much bigger readiness to maybe pay a euro or two more for a high quality European product. So we need clear labeling, where's the stuff coming from? I mean, to have a labeling that says, well, this glass contains EU and non-EU honey without even quoting how much, yeah? This could be 1% of EU honey and 99% of Chinese honey, yeah? So this is a way to trick customers. And I think we have urgently have to end that because at the end of the day, customers are on our side. On our side, I mean on the side of farmers and beekeepers, uh, uh, most of the consumers, not all of them, but many. And this would actually strengthen European agriculture and European beekeepers a lot. And the second thing is, I think in the cap, we have to mention directly and clearly that beekeepers should be part of the aimed society group that is granted taxpayers money for their work they do up to now it's farmers i am a farmer and a beekeeper so i am included in a way but if you don't have land if you don't own land but if you are a beekeeper only uh, you're not included into agricultural subsidies which is ridiculous from my point of view because if you know anything about the functioning of agriculture and the important role that pollinators serve us for our daily food production uh, they are a key element of a successful agriculture and I think we should have them in focus also to serve and support our beekeepers across Europe with a substantial contribution of tax money. Well, I think in my case, that's very clear. I'm a beekeeper myself. I'm an organic farmer myself. I'm very much linked also to civil society and environmental protection uh, uh, groups. And, and uh, this is what I used to do before I came to the parliament to fight for a more environmental friendly agricultural system and to fight for a chance for our bees. This is what I'm going to continue in the future on all levels. Bees are a crucial part of our food production. They are a crucial part of environment as such. So it must be clear that that this has to be a priority of saving our pollinators. Second of all, I think uh, to consumers, uh be critical if you if you buy products in the supermarket have a close look where the stuff is coming from and if you can buy your honey at your local beekeeper at your local farmer that has bees because this actually supports your beekeeper most and gives you the best guarantee to get a real natural and healthy product